Good morning, friends, on this Thursday, the 9th of September, early spring. Lovely to be here. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about the best subject that anyone can really talk about, and that's love. And that's um, all about the commandment, the, the two first commandments that God gives us and he says they are the most important um, which is love God and love your neighbor as yourself and you will often hear people say it's in the Bible and Mark uh, often says it in his sermons that the, the, the Christian message can be summed up in one word and that's love so today I've got some scripture for you I've got Merton um, and we are going to look at the scriptures to see where this is validated and we're going to look at Merton's commentary and go through it and unpack it. Okay, so here we go. Uh, and yes, if you're wondering, I had a very severe haircut and I'm grateful to God today that he grows. <laughs> so, not only the uh, theme of love is important in our Christian world, but also the theme of unity, of loving not just people who are like us, but even the people who we find difficult to love. And you know, we need to understand people in order to be able to love them. Um, a friend of mine was having some trouble with uh, someone in the place she was living and saying what an awful person she was and I challenged her and I said well what a great opportunity to learn to love your enemy <laughs> I don't think that went down too well but uh, but it's true you know when you find yourself disliking someone it's time to actually sit down and say this is not about me. It's never about you when someone is unkind to you, but it is about their pain. And it's just that you are there and it's being inflicted on you because they haven't come to terms with it themselves. And so we need to pray for them and we need to surround them in God's love and our own love because we are part of them. We are all part of each other in the unity of God. So I'm going to uh, just give you some scriptures um, where you can find some scripture that talks about love. Um, you can find it in Galatians, I think it's Galatians 5, 1 Corinthians, the famous, famous one, verse 13. Um, that's a beautiful one that talks about love. And then, uh, and go back to it. You know, we think we, oh, you know, we know that one and we hear it at weddings. But we need to go back and read what love is really about. It's not an easy a task that, that we are given by Paul. Um, also, Ephesians 4, beautiful passage about love. Um, sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, go back to chapter 12 and read about the parts of the body and how everyone is important and everyone has a place and between all of us we actually form the body of Christ with all the gifts and uh, love and anything we need to be God's people in faith. Matthew 22 and uh, we'll also uh, repeat God's uh, first two commandments and there's even a passage in Leviticus, which I forgot to pick up the Old Testament, which talks about love. You don't often see that in the Old Testament because they were very much the kind of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth type. But um, it, it, it is there. I didn't find it this morning. You can Google it um, and you'll see it there. So before I ramble on too much, I want to um, I picked this passage up this morning when I was doing my early morning prayers and um, and this is what gave me the idea of doing this theme of love today at midday, midday prayers. So I'm going to read it, it um, gets a bit heavy but uh, I will unpack it for you. Okay, 
and I'm not being rude and saying that you don't have the brain to understand it, but Newton, when he gets intense, he gets intense. And uh, myself, I have to read and reread and look up and uh, find out what he is actually saying. So Newton says that very few men are sanctified in isolation. Very few become perfect in absolute solitude. Living with other people and learning to lose ourselves in the understanding of their weakness and deficiencies can help us to become true contemplators, deep prayers. For well, there is no better means of getting rid of the rigidity and harshness and coarseness of our ingrained egotism, which is the one insuperable obstacle to the infused light and action of the Spirit of God. Even the courageous acceptance of interior trials in utter solitude cannot altogether compensate for the work of purification accomplished by us, in us, by patience and humility in loving other men and women and sympathizing with their most unreasonable needs and demands. There is always a danger that hermits will only dry up and solidify in their own eccentricity. Living out of touch with people, they tend to lose that deep sense of spiritual realities, which only pure love can give. Do you think the way to sanctity is to lock yourself up with your prayers and your books and the meditations? that please and interest your mind to protect yourself with many walls against people you consider stupid? Do you think the way of contemplative prayer is found in the refusal of activities and works which are necessary for the good of others, but which happen to bore and distract you? Do you imagine that you will discover God by winding yourself up in a cocoon of spiritual and aesthetic pleasures, instead of renouncing all your tastes and desires and ambitions and satisfactions for the love of Christ, who will not even live, with, live within you if you cannot find him in other men and women. I'm going to read that last sentence again. God will not even live within you if you cannot find him in other men. So let's just go back a bit and start again and uh, let me unpack some of these things. So he's talking, obviously, um, Merton you know, did live a very isolated life in the monastery, but he never neglected an, um, action in the world. And he often emphasized that prayer is fine, it's wonderful, it's a way to God, but it is nothing if it does not end in some kind of loving action. So he says very few people will become purified and found God when they live in isolation from others. Because living with other people and learning to lose ourselves in understanding their weaknesses and our deficiency and the and deficiencies, that can help us to become true people of prayer who can pray and sit in the presence of God. We need some kind of strength that in our worldliness we don't have, but that God can give us to reach out to understand people who we don't like, people who hurt us, people who we believe are doing wrong in the world. So he says there's no better means for getting so let me just say this before I carry on. Uh, one of the ways that we uh, deepen our journey to God and we become pu purified as God's people is by 
um, this process of kenosis, which I've mentioned before and which uh, Mike has often mentioned, whereby we empty ourselves out of worldly things, things that are not of God, so that there is space in our heart, in our lives, for God. It's called self-emptying. So that is what Merton is referring to in this next paragraph. paragraph. Pardon me. He says, there is no better means of getting rid of the rigidity and harshness and cautious of our own ingrained egotism. I spoke to you recently about the true self and the false self. And egotism would be part of the false self because it's the part of us that doesn't have anything to do with God, doesn't express our true essence as God made us, but we are taken up with worldly things. We lust after um, money, uh, wealth, uh, we are greedy, we are envious, because we want to be on top, we want to be in control, and that is ungodly. And that's what we have to dispose of in order to be able to sit in prayer in God's presence. So he says that um, learning to live with others can actually do that to us. It can reveal um, the parts of us that are not good. And it can replace them by finding compassion and being kind to these people. It makes a place for God within us. It replaces ungodly hatred and anger with godly compassion and kindness as we try to grapple with God's command that we must love others and we must be in union with others, as the scriptures will tell you. And he calls it the insuperable obstacle to the infused light and action of the Spirit of God. So he says, egotism um, and looking after oneself and not reaching out to others is the one main obstacle to us getting closer to God and deepening our spiritual journey. Even the courageous acceptance of interior trials in utter solitude cannot altogether compensate for the work of purification accomplished in us by patience and humility in loving other people and sympathizing with their most unreasonable needs and demands. You need to have a lot of love in your heart. When you find yourself in the position, for example, of caring for a person who is ill and can't look after themselves and is dealing with the frustration of losing their own autonomy, as they have grown old and their body has let them down. I'm sure many of you have been in that position. They are not loving and gracious with their nearest carers. They express that pain um, about coming to the end of their lives, about coming to the end of their effectiveness, their control over their lives and having to have someone else look after them in the most intimate of ways. They are angry. And it takes the deepest of loving hearts that understand, that make an effort to understand why this is happening, and to love through the pain that's being thrown at them. So that's a really um, important point that Merton is making. So he says that hermits will only dry up. People who live alone, who never interact with others, they will just dry up. Remember, we understand ourselves through the interaction with other people. Other people tell us to a large extent who we are. Of course, it isn't always accurate and we don't have to believe it, but we do learn from that. You know, I have learned in my lifetime 
that how other people see me is not how I see myself, but that there is some truth in the way that they see me. It's been very enlightening to me to hear what other people think about me. And that experience has been both positive and negative. And in terms of my own spiritual growth, I've had to process that. But you cannot live alone without any kind of action of love and compassion in the world. Not if you want to be a follower of Christ. The challenges of love that I've just been talking about and loving through dislike, through difficulty, they come from a heart of pure love. And many of you, I'm sure, are married and have been through that um, sort of experience when your relationship with the person you married starts to sour um, and you begin to think that you married the wrong person and wonder why things aren't the way they used to be. And that is normally because you have closed your heart and you have being unable to love that person as they reveal their authentic self with all its scars and marks that you never saw when you were blinded by romantic love. And you, if you have gone through that and you've come out the other side, then you will know that Love is so much more than romantic love and it's hard and it's difficult and you have to stay the course but the rewards are there if you do. God will reward you and you will find an inexplicable love that is deep, profound and pure that will take you and the person you love through anything. <clears throat> Did you think that the way to sanctity is to lock yourself up with your prayers and your books and meditations that please and interest your mind to protect yourself with many walls against people you consider stupid? Um, this last paragraph I have to listen very carefully to um, because I am a bit of an introvert and I do so cut myself off from, it's really for fear of rejection, it's um, fear of upsetting someone, fear that someone won't like me, fear that I'll do the wrong thing, that, you know, as the priest's wife, fear of all these things. Um, and I kind of think that if I just stay at home, do my writing, read my books, you know, I won't have to deal with these elements of myself that confront me out in the world. But that's not what God put us on earth to do. God put us on earth to be his hands and feet, to reach out, to heal people who are in pain. Um, and he gifts us to do whatever it is we are meant to do. Do you think that the way to contemplation is found in the refusal of activities and works which are necessary for the good of others, but which happen to bore and distract you? Um, gosh, this really hits home for me. You know, there are so many things in the church that I could be doing that I'm not doing. Because, you know, I just prefer to stay home and do my writing. Because I really enjoy that and I do believe that I've been called to do that but you know we often get requests you know for people to make sandwiches for, for the homeless and to help in the tea garden and the church and really you know I could do that I could do that I could make sandwiches and I could I could help in the tea garden but I don't because it means being with others it means 
putting myself out there with the risk of being judged. So this part where it says um, refusal to work in activities which are necessary for the good of others, but which happen to bore and distract me, I wouldn't think that, that they bore me, they do distract me from my work, but it is a gift that I can give to someone. It's such an easy thing to do. I don't ever consider anyone stupid, but I do get irritated sometimes when I'm trying to get a message through and I don't get it through. Um, yeah, so this passage is for me, you know, and I don't, perhaps for you too, you know, why, you know, why don't we do things? Why don't we get involved in, in the church's activities that provide compassion and kindness to people? Um, that is how we love one another. That is the first and second commandment. And if we don't love God, we can't love each other because we don't know how to love without God. Do you imagine that you will discover God by winding yourself up in a cocoon of spiritual and aesthetic pleasures? Instead of renouncing all your tastes and desires and ambitions, and satisfaction for the love of Christ. And this is so important. Who will not even live within you if you cannot find him in other people. The way that we spread the message of the gospel is because people see love, the love of God, in our eyes, in our face, in the way we, we interact with them. Do we, do we share love or are we reticent? Are we trying to do as little as possible, you know, a formal greeting and, a mo and then a moving on? Or do we stop and look at that person and say, what is the need here? How can I make this person know the love of Christ by being kind and compassionate? Everything that God asks of us really isn't easy because to be pure like God isn't easy. But everything that he asks for us is for our own good, for our own joy and for the joy of the world. So I leave you with that thought and perhaps you can reflect on some of the things I've talked about in terms of whether they relate to you. So thank you for listening and God bless you all. Lots of love.